Hey everybody, it's hump day, happy hump day, happy Wednesday, see if I can get this light, <clears throat> can everybody hear me, <laughs> I know my last video I was having technical difficulties, and thank goodness I have recorded it on my Instagram, um, so I could end up uploading it later on my YouTube channels. But I hope everybody is having a wonderful day. Um, I don't know how many of y'all might know about the subject that I'm speaking on tonight, but on your way in, please click the like button. Please make sure you click subscribe if you are not already a subscriber. And also please share this because we are going to be talking about something really good, a really good documentary that I found on Netflix. And I guess I came across it because I was checking out YouTube, just, you know, randomly trying to find something to watch on YouTube. And I came across that documentary and it's called Abducted in Plain Sight. And what it is, for those of y'all who haven't seen it already, um, it's basically a documentary regarding, um, regarding... I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> reading a message here. <laughs> but um, basically, it's a documentary regarding this uh, little girl. Um, her name is Jan Broberg. That was her name then at that time. Her name now is Jan Broberg Felt, F-E-L-T. And the documentary, and, and also there's a book out there. There's several different books out there as well. Um, but the documentary was basically about a girl who at the age of 12 was groomed um, by an older man who was around the age of 40. And she was kidnapped twice by this man and never charged, never served one day. He had kidnapped her. He had sexually assaulted her, um, took her out of the country everything and he was never charged for it why you might ask because her parents didn't appear to witness they told the prosecutors they didn't want to press charges they wanted to just handle the situation at home you know with their family and everything and the prosecutors they was like upset like why you guys don't want to uh, file charges why you guys don't want to press charges why you guys don't want him to go to jail or go to prison for what he did to your daughter okay this documentary was something kind of crazy but i swear if you ever watch the documentary you might be like hmm i know somebody who can relate to this documentary if it's not yourself it could be a friend a cousin, a neighbor, a aunt, a uncle, your parent who might could relate to this documentary because back then, back in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, you know, back in those times, um, a lot of families, when things happen like this, they didn't want the law to handle it. A lot of times the law never even found out. A lot of times nobody ever found out besides the immediate people involved, like the child, um, the person that sexually assaulted or raped them, and maybe the parent, and maybe somebody else, maybe another person. But normally, a lot of the things back in the day was swept under the rug. Um, I don't know how often it's swept under the rug now, but I can say for sure, I know a lot of situations that were swept under the rug in my circle of family and friends and even associates like coworkers. You know, people sometimes get together and they tell their story for, for one reason or another. And you be like, dang, that happened to you too? And your parent or your aunt or nobody did anything about it? And that person still walking around free today? And they still around your family, still around your circle, still coming over on holidays, and nothing ever happened. So, 
I'm sure I'm not the only one who know of those kind of situations. But, <laughs> but regarding this story of Jen, um, again, she was 12 years old and their family um, belonged to church. I think it was uh, Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. They belonged to, you know, that congregation. And one day... Jan's mother, her name is Mary Ann, and her father's name, by the way, is Bob. And one day, Mary Ann saw a family at church, and she didn't recognize them before because the family was actually, I think they were like either new in town or just new in their community. And she kind of like, you know, welcomed them into their, basically into their family, into their circle. She ended up getting to know the, the wife. The wife's name was Gail. They had five kids. The Gail's husband's name was uh, Robert, and who they later called B. And they said they don't remember who exactly called him B or gave him that nickname, but that's what they later known him to be as B. Um, Jan, her mother, uh, back then, it was like around 74, which is funny because that's around the time I was born. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, um, she had befriended the wife and they became best friends. And Robert, he was always coming over to the family's house. You know, they was having like cookouts. You know how you do. You know how you do when you have when you're a couple or or even not a couple. But you have some good friends and you're always at their house or they're always at your house. But he was always at her house. Um, and a lot more often than his wife was, which, I mean, there's going to be so many red flags that I'm going to speak about that you're going to say, why the hell did the mom and dad not realize what was going on? This man, Robert, he would come over to their house all the time without his children most of the time, without his wife most of the time. And he would hang with them. He would, uh, like I said, they would eat together. They would go out together. He would pick them up sometimes and just take them out for the day. Um, just, you know, things that friends, you know, friends do. Best friends or, you know, close uh, relatives, you know, things that you do. Just spending quality time with each other. Um, but during that time, the girl, Jan, during that time, he was grooming her without her parents having any idea. Jan, I really don't even think that she knew that she was being groomed. Um, the man, Bob, I'm sorry, Robert or B, he basically had made himself so accustomed to being around his family that they were so used to him. The kids, you know, they started calling him like basically, they didn't call him dad, but they looked to him as a second father, you know, as a third parent. And they they were safe around him. They, they felt safe. They trusted him. Um, he played games with them. Sometimes they would sleep over to his house. They would have like campouts in the backyard and, you know, just all type of things that you would just think are normal, just normal. But what wasn't normal was the attention that he was giving Jan over the other siblings. Now, Jan had a sister named Karen, and she had a sister named Susan. So her parents, Marianne and Bob, they had three kids, three girls, no boys. He paid a lot more attention to Jan, and that's another clue, like, Y'all keep track of these red flags. Uh, one of them was he was coming over a lot without his children, coming over a lot without his wife. And another clue was he paid a lot more attention to Jan. Like, he would be taking pictures of her all the time. And, I mean, she would be sitting on his lap all the time. He would be holding her and hugging her and all kind of stuff like that. Matter of fact, let me show you some of the pictures. Y'all on um, Instagram, if y'all want to tune in on Facebook, I mean, not Facebook, if you want to tune in on YouTube, my YouTube channel, Tanya Knows No Limit, you can actually see, like, the pictures and things that I'm going to show. Hey, Miss Queen of Talk, did you see that show? <laughs> Did you see that show on Netflix? Them parents were so crazy, like so, so crazy. 
um it was it was really like appalling to me how much i could tell from the very beginning that the parents were making a mistake by let, allowing this man to continually hang around their family but for some reason they didn't see it they like totally trusted him and the documentary pissed me off too it really did piss me off and it was like um let me show a picture for some of the people who uh haven't seen the movie okay this is a picture right here of the entire family <clears throat> jan she's the older sister um the biggest of them all up there with the well they all kind of got like reddish hair but um those her mom marianne her dad bob her sister susan and karen and here is the guy with jan his name was Robert, a.k.a. B. You said, what same parent would allow all that? Then sleep with the guy themselves. You know what, Miss Gina? <laughs> I'm telling you, when I watched this, I was thoroughly confused. Like, thoroughly confused. Like, I didn't understand at all. Like, first of all, first of all, the guy was showing so much attention to her. Like, not asking to take all the girls on field trips for one like when they were going um uh parasailing or going fishing or you know things like that he was specifically asked can jan go specifically and he showed her so much attention and he was just fixated on her so much i don't see how they couldn't see it like the i don't understand and then I read a lot of reviews where a lot of people were saying, this can't be true. They had to know. Like, they had to know. I'm like, he he did. He manipulated the whole system, the whole community, the whole family. He totally manipulated everybody. And it's crazy because this man, he was out there basically... Every chance he got, every chance he got with this little girl, he was sexually assaulting her. He was grooming her to be like his wife. Uh, what you think about that story he told her about the aliens? Like, did, you remember that part when he was telling her about the aliens? Like, she was so young and so gullible and so naive um i don't put any blame on her i never put a blame on a child i don't care how old that child is 13 14 15 16 whatever because it's always the older person the adult to make the right decision and what to do and what not to do a child still has a child mind even if they a teenager they might look grown they might try to act like they grown but you know how i go you know how it go. He believed everything she said. Everything. Like he told her, um, okay, like when he kidnapped her the first time. He kidnapped her the first time. He told her mom he wanted to take her horseback riding. And the mom was like, no, 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 no. Now this is after a long period of time where he seemed fixated on their daughter. They even talked about it in a documentary. Like they felt uneasy about him sometimes and it was kind of weird, but they still allowed him to be in their life to spend time with their family. And when he had asked to take her horseback riding, her mom was like, no, 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 no. She got, you know, piano lessons. She can't go. She got school tomorrow. It's a school night. Um, <laughs> She said, okay, just have her back before her dad gets home. I was like, okay, okay, okay. When they never came back and hours and hours and hours went by and they never came back, they were like, okay, you know, maybe we should call the police. Three hours later, they didn't call the police. They didn't call the authorities. They was just like, oh, you know, we trust him. He'll never do anything to her. And then the next day, they didn't come back. 
They still, oh, we trust him. He would never do anything to her. I'm like, what was wrong with these parents? When my son is 20 minutes late, I'm calling the school. Uh, was the bus late? Did the bus not show up on time? Um, did something happen at school? Where is my child? I mean, I was like that mom that was on it. <laughs> I knew where my children was and still do every minute of the day. That was crazy. You said the mom said she liked how he made her feel. And that's what was the crazy part. Like, the mom and dad... I guess for some reason, I'm taking it as Gina. Let me know how you might be taking it. Um, I'm taking it as if they probably didn't have a big sexual attraction to each other anymore by that point. Because she said she was then married by like 16 years when their neighbor, Robert, <laughs> when he started seducing her. Like, your child is getting manipulated at home by a neighbor, somebody that you keep being skeptical about, but you allow him to stay around you guys. And then he also, also manipulates you too. And like the first part when she said, you know, the first time she said, well, you know, he had asked me to bring him lunch because he couldn't get away for lunch. Like, you got a whole husband at home. He has a whole wife at home. Why is he calling you to bring him lunch? Tell me, could you make me a sandwich and bring me this, this, that, and a third to work? I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, it's like so many things that went, like, that was, like, really awkward with this family. I... I I cannot believe it. I mean, if I if I wasn't watching it, if I wasn't watching the interviews, I, I wouldn't believe that it really happened. And then she talking about, oh, we just fondled and we just caressed and we just whoop, 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 and nothing sexual ever happened. I don't believe that. I do not believe that part. She just stopped <laughs> and then she went back home. <laughs> I don't believe that part. You said, and she, and she rushed to do it. Yeah, she rushed right down there like as if that was her husband who was asking her to bring him lunch. I was like, that that was crazy. And then, and then keep in mind, while the man, Robert, was spending so much time, quality time with their daughter, Jan, their oldest daughter, who was then 12 years old, not only did he sexual seduce the wife, but also one day he called the husband. He called the husband and asked him, could he, you know, he needed to talk. He got a lot of things on his mind. Could he get away from his store? Because her, her dad owned his own floral store. And the dad was like, oh, okay, sure. Come by swing, pick me up. He picks him up and they drive off to whatever, um, some back rows or wherever, and he's telling him, which is probably the same thing he told her wife, his wife, you know, he told, uh, when he was, you know, seducing the wife, he probably told her the same story. Me and my wife, you know, we haven't been getting along lately. We're not having any involvement with each other. He told the husband, um, I'm not getting any gratification at home and I just need to release. Could you help me release? You just ask your neighbor that, and he, <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> you right. That's what I believe. I believe the dad was gay. I, I, there's no other way around it. I cannot picture two straight guys driving along the road. And one of them say, could you help release me? Because my wife ain't doing it for me. And you just reach over and handle, handle it for them. I was like, come on now. You got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. So he done manipulated the mom. He done manipulated. And I don't even want to say manipulated the husband because, I don't know, I think the husband probably already was kind of into that. But, you know, back then in the 70s, the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, that that wasn't something you wanted to be known for in your community. And they, was, they belonged to, you know, Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints Church as well. Um, you know, there was a pillar in his community. He owned a floral shop. I mean, that's just something that you did not want associated with you back in those days was that you were gay or a lesbian or anything like that. 
<clears throat> and I think it uh, hid your comment, Miss Gina. Let me show. Oh, okay. But you said no real man would have went for that BS. A real man would have beat. Thank you. He would have pulled that car over, grabbed that steering wheel. <laughs> what you say? You want me to do what? <laughs> no. Yeah. So, anywho, I believe that the husband, you know, either thought about it, have done it before, or was looking for the right opportunity, or maybe he was attracted to him, a.k.a. he was gay. That's truly what I believe. So he done got to both of them. Got to both of them, which is right where he needed them. And Miss Gina, I watched this uh, story. I heard this story before in the past. I uh, watched the documentary. And out of everything I've seen and heard, I could be wrong. I could be reaching. But I have a strong, strong feeling that he was having sex with both of them parents on a regular basis. I mean, the wife ended up saying she was messing around with him for like eight, nine months. Um, the husband admitted to that happening in the car. I think they were having a relationship. And I think he used that. That This is just what I think. I think he used that for blackmail to get to their daughter. To spend more time with their daughter. Because there's no way from all the interviews and from what they all was saying, like how much he, he would buy stuff for, he would treat her basically way different and way better than the other girls. Um, taking her out parasailing, horseback right? I mean, taking her everywhere with him. Like that was his little daughter. And he got kids at home and he ain't even spending time with them like that. That's just what I think. I really do think that's what happened. And that's why he was able to get away with it for all those years of sexually assaulting and molesting their daughter. I was like, by the next day, when they didn't call the cops, and they were still like, oh, you know, um, you know, we trust him. The wife even came over, Gail, the wife even came over. And I think she knew too. I think she knew too. I think she knew everything. And... The next day, the wife was like, oh, you know, my husband, you know, he's going to bring them back. They'll be back any moment. Please don't call the police. Hmm. Hmm. Throw, like you said, throw the whole family away. I'm so serious. Throw the whole family away. When they finally, when they finally reached out to authorities, it was day five. Your 12-year-old is missing with somebody that you... You kind of think it's kind of, you know, some shady about this guy. Some shady about this guy. Because keep in mind, the sexual activities between the parents happened later. So when he, you know, first, when he first took her, it was like, your child is missing day after day after day after day. You haven't heard a word from him. You don't know if the car broke down. They could have both been kidnapped. They could have died in a car wreck, and you haven't reached out to the cops. And the FBI guy named, uh, what was his name, Pete? The FBI guy named Pete, who was assigned to the case, he was like, he knew automatically. He said, your daughter being kidnapped. They was like, oh, no, no, he didn't keep that. No, 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 we trust him. We just think something might have happened to them. I, I, they had on so many blinders. Like, they had on so many blinders. He tried to break it down to them. Your daughter has been kidnapped. You guys should be scared. Like, you guys should be scared. <laughs> I'm like, wow. I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Even after the FBI told him all that, he was like, okay. You know, maybe she was kidnapped. Maybe. And then, you know, they was like, okay, you know, trying. they started interviewing people in the community. You said them parents wanted that man to stay around for their own gratification. That's what I think. I'm telling you, that's what I think. I totally agree with you, Gina. 
I totally agree with you. Okay, people on Instagram and YouTube, I'm, I got both of y'all up. So if, <laughs> if y'all hear me talking to people and the name ain't on the screen, it's because I'm talking. They on the other uh, <laughs> social media site. But um, they interviewed his wife. They interviewed the community. Um, and then they also interviewed his brother. And his brother told him, um, that fool, he crazy. He like little girls. He's a pervert. He's a known pedophile. He was like, one day, my parents called him messing with our little sister. I'm like, okay, so <laughs> everybody else knows about this man being fixated with little girls. But this family who he was constantly around, they didn't pick up those vibes like at all. This is what they claim. This is what they claim. This is what they claim. They didn't pick up those vibes at all. At all. And then they interviewed the wife, Gail. And she was like, you know, I think I might know where he might be at. He could be, you know, in his mobile home or whatever. So they went to try to find a mobile home. He had took off in the mobile home because it was at a storage unit. So he took off in the mobile home. And then he made it seem like, uh, made it seem like they were kidnapped. Because they said they found a car um, with the keys in it and some blood and the windows was broken out. But they only found one uh, foot footprints that matched his footprints. But they couldn't find any footprints of the little girl. So they assumed he was probably carrying her around, which was the case. That was the case. But like I said, the craziest part for me was... This man had been sick, like you said, Miss Gina, for years. Sick for years. And he had came to their community from another community. The man had sexually assaulted and raped like six, seven other little girls before he even got to their family. And then two of the families, he had almost got to their little girls, but the parents... They, they sisters went off. The red flags went up. I'm sure he was probably doing the same thing he was doing to her, which was grooming his little girl, making her feel totally, totally comfortable and safe with him. And But they picked up. They picked up on it, and they put him out of their circle. I'm sorry, you can't come around us any longer. I don't want to see you around my children anymore, which is what you're supposed to do. But does that happen all the time? Nope. Nope, it does not happen all the time. If it didn't happen to somebody close to you, you still probably know somebody it happened to where parents didn't do anything and their child was getting raped and molested right in her own home, right in their own home, whether it was a guy or a boy, because it happens to boys too. It happens to boys too. But yeah, his brother was like, he's been a pervert. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if he if he kidnapped your daughter, he's probably doing you know what to the brother knew. Like he totally knew and told the FBI, oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's what he does. That's his MO, that's what he likes, little girls. But the parents, I'm like, they was allowing him to sleep in her in her bed. Like, who does that? Who allows a man that's 40 years old? To sleep in their 12 year old daughter's bed. And that's why I don't totally believe the entire story. Like I really think that he has something over on them. Which was probably him having sex with one. Because you got to keep in mind y'all. This was back in the 70s. Where everybody who was gay. Not everybody. But mostly everybody who was gay. Bi, les, whatever. It was under cover you you didn't tell people that kind of stuff her when she found out what happened between the man and her husband she didn't want it to get out to nobody she didn't want it to get out to nobody and when they found her daughter like okay what was crazy was okay i'm like for y'all who didn't watch the show i'm gonna give y'all a little bit of um the information that happened the first time he kidnapped her. Um, the first time he kidnapped the girl, Jen, who's 12. He was about 40. He took her in his mobile home and they drove all over the place. 
they they winded up somewhere in Mexico. I can't even remember the name of the uh the name of the place in Mexico. It's like Mahal, Mahal, Mexico or something like that. But anywho, um basically he kidnapped the little girl. It was uh fall of nineteen ninety four and took her across the country. What he did was he isolated her in a room after he drugged her. He had told her that she was, um, this, he was giving her her allergy medicine that her mom had handed him her allergy medicine, you know, before they went horseback riding just in case her allergies floor flare up. But he really was giving her like some kind of relaxation drug, like sleeping medicine, something like that. So then he isolated her into, um, one, I guess it was probably one of the bedrooms or something. And he had like a little box next to her head. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> this man like totally thought this through and through and through before it really happened, before he really put, you know, his plans into work. Uh, and he had like, I'm, I'm assuming it was probably like a walkie talkie or something. Cause it, it was like a little radio, a little microphone, you know, something like that. He had next to her head, and while she's in and out, and you know, sleeping really, really hard, you know, in and out because of the drugs, she's hearing this talk to her in her head. Keep in mind, she's 12 years old, and he's telling her, um, basically acting like an alien. He's acting like an alien, telling her, um, you know. Uh, you have a mission and your mission is by the age of 16, you have to have a baby by such and such. And if you don't have a baby by such and such and such and engage with him, um, your daughter, one of her, one of her sisters is going to go blind. The other sister is going to come up missing. Her, her mom is going to be killed. I mean, it, they was just said the things that people say to children. When they try to bait them and try to rape them or sexually assault them, they tell them all kind of stuff. We're going to cut your mom's tongue out. We're going we gonna to set your house on fire with all your siblings in it. You know, just things like that. And she was under the influence of drugs. Basically, she was brainwashed. Yes, she was brainwashed. And he was able to easily manip manipulate her mind and brainwash her because she was under the influence of drugs when she was hearing all this information. And mind you, around that time, remember around that time when there was always UFO sightings, so-called UFO sightings, people was always talking about aliens, you know, Imagine being a 12 year old and you hear your parents, the people in the news, you know, always talking about aliens and UFO sightings. And then you drugged up and you keep hearing something in your ear aliens, you got to do this. And what the aliens call themselves? Nefa, Nefra, and something. I forgot. Nefra and something. But um, it was two aliens who were talking to her. But they basically was him. Speaking to her in her ear through this uh, piece of equipment is like an intercom box or something. And they were Zeta and Zephra. That's their name. Zeta and Zephra, the aliens. And they told her, well, him, They he told her that her dad was alien. So her mom is really her mom, but her dad is really from you know, out of space. So she's half alien and she, her mission is to save the earth and she has to have a child by the age of 16. And if she don't, like I said, harm was going to come to her family. So when she woke up, they told her also when she was like in and out, in and out that her companion was going to be in the other room. And lo and behold, she wakes up and goes into the other room and guess who's lying there on the couch? <laughs> of course, Robert. Yes, right, Miss Gina. I remember all that because I was born in the 70s and the UFOs was all, all in the news back then. It was people always, you know, seeing something or taking pictures and I mean, just all kind of stuff to do with aliens back then. And she seen him. And he was laying there like he was like 
hurt or asleep or passed out and he wakes up and tells her after she's shaking him like wake up wake up wake up there's blood all over him and stuff and she's thinking he's really hurt and he comes to you know wakes wakes up and he's like oh man we was driving and we went to um to go horseback riding and then this bright light shined down in front of us and then next thing i know the car start shaking and woo -woo -woo -woo. and then next thing i know i'm passed out okay she's drugged she's in and out of a deep sleep she's hearing these voices talk to her it's around the alien time of the you know century when everybody was into aliens and seeing ufos and then he has blood all over him what else was she supposed to believe at that age i mean children are so impressionable and and i can imagine what was going through her head and then all of a sudden she's like well you, you know you got to get up you know because we have a mission and that's when she starts talking to him about this mission and does he say what the heck is you talking about girl what you mean girl we gotta have sex uh, you gotta have my baby what please <laughs> she played right into her he was playing her like putty like putty playing with her like putty so for y'all who haven't watched the show um that's basically where and how she started to believe that what she was doing was right for the sake of her family. So I just want to make sure y'all y'all understood all this, how he groomed her, how he manipulated her, her little young mind. After that, every chance he got, when he was driving through the country, trying to get her out the country, he would assault her. Like, it wasn't like a... Um, it wasn't like uh, where he tried to it, like try to injure her like a vi it wasn't violent it wasn't like violent rape or anything like that what she explained in her documentary was that he always seemed like he wanted her to feel just as comfortable as he did or she he he wanted her to enjoy it just as much as he did. So I'm just assuming that he took his time with her. He was really, really um, gentle. And because he couldn't scare her away. He couldn't scare her away and make her think that he was really doing something wrong. So he treated her real precious. And he did that all the way through the States, all the way till they got to Mexico. And once they got to Mexico... He married that little girl. Now you know in Mexico. I don't know what the legal age is now. But back then the legal age to get married was 12. So now during all this time while he's out there, you know, driving across the states trying to get her away, you know, as far away as possible. The family is back at home. Finally, they realizing, okay, yeah, she's been kidnapped. She's been gone for a long time. It was about three weeks, about three weeks, I believe, before they had heard anything, you know, about uh, anything from her or him. And what had happened was this fool, he didn't call his brother and told him to convince her parents, Marianne and, and Bob, to convince them to sign some kind of consent, uh, permission, something like that, that he has permission or consent to marry her in the States. And if they did that, he would bring her back into the States. Now the brother, he was like, I'm sure he's thinking at that time, like, this my I can't believe this is my brother. I can't believe this is my brother. Sleeping around and marrying little girls. Like, now, I was quite surprised when the parents were like, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You was not marrying our daughter. You're not bringing her. How could you marry her in Mexico? No, you do not have our permission to marry her in the States. Because in the States, I think you had to be 
what did they say it was? 16? You know, depending on what state you lived in, you know. Um, and they were in Idaho. So it depends on what state you were living in. But they was like, no. And I was surprised. I was like, what? Y'all, what? <laughs> He's sleeping in her bed. He going on road trips with her. He's doing everything else with his little girl, treating her like his little wife. But they said, no, nope, no. Nope. So basically what happened was the brother felt real bad. And he was like, oh, uh, you know what? This is wrong. What he's doing wrong. I know he's not going to come back to the States. He will die before he come back to the States because he don't want to go to jail. Not for one day. That's all he kept saying. Every time he would get caught doing something, he would rather die to go to jail or go to prison for even one day. So the brother ended up talking to the FBI and telling them he will help them catch his brother. And that's basically how they found him. The brother let him tap they tap his phone. They figure out where he was. They went down there, kicked the door into his mobile home, and you know, took him to jail, took her to jail, and she stayed there till her parents came and picked her up. And he went to jail. Now, what pissed me off about this whole story, about this whole story, is the fact that. The parents, at first, they wanted to press charges. They wanted to press charges. They were down with it, you know, with the FBI, um, the prosecutors, you know, the judge, everybody. This man about to go down. He he been having sex with an underage child. He done kidnapped her. He done took her across country, across the states, out of country. I mean, they had to extradite him back. Okay, he's about to go down. That's what you would have thought. What had happened. But instead what had happened was. The man told them. Robert. A.K.A. B. <laughs> he told them. That if they pressed charges. On him. And if he went to jail. If he served any time. If he you know got to serve any amount of time. He was going to reveal. What had happened between. Her and her, her husband. And him the gay sexual encounter and she wanted to protect their family and wanted to protect her husband so much so much that she agreed to it he said you have to sign you have to sign a piece of paper you have to write it down you have to tell the fbi you have to tell you know everybody that it was a mistake um he was just taking our daughter on vacation he thought he had permission um he should have told you know the family you know uh what he was doing but that was his mistake um and they gave into it they gave into it I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? But keep in mind what time it was. It was in them 70s. It was in those 70s. Around 74 when this happened. In 74 when this happened. And I'm sure her husband was like, oh no. Oh, my family's going to find out. Oh, my church is going to find out. Oh, my customers and my store is going to find out. And, you know, I'm gay. Or he's probably going to make it seem like he's gay. Because he was going to tell them that they was having sexual relations and all kind of stuff. Not just what, what the husband said happened in the car, which he just relieved him. You know what I'm saying? Just relieved him. But he was going to tell him all kind of other stuff. And I was like, so, basically, to save your own, to save your own embarrassment, you basically put yourself before your child. Before your child, you put yourself before your child. So that you can stay undercover
that is so sad. Like, that is so, so sad. And the man was able to get off. He was able to get off. And he was able to go back home. But then, you know, while he was still in jail, he had, um, he was still manipulating the little girl, Jan. And they had them separated in jail. She was, like, in a lower, lower area of the jail. And he was somewhere else. And he bribed, well, not bribed the uh, security or the, you know, the people working at the jail. But he gave them a gold ring that he had on his finger in order for him to be able to talk to Jan. And when he talked to her, he basically told her, um, you cannot, the aliens don't want you to say anything. You cannot do four things or the aliens, you know, they'll do what they said they was going to do, which was basically harm your family. You can't tell anybody what happened. You can't tell them we've been having sex. You can't tell them, you know, about anything, basically. And she's still being manipulated and brainwashed and everything. She was like, okay, okay, because she don't want her sisters to die. She don't want her other sister eyes to be poked out and she go blind. She don't want her mom to die. So she agreed not to say anything. He had her. He had her wrapped around his little finger, brainwashed, manipulated. Um, I was... It was so sad. It was so sad. And when her mom and dad went down there to get her from the jail, they flew down there to get her from the jail. They thinking that she's going to be all excited and, you know, happy to see them like a normal child would be, you know. But sometimes, sometimes the victim, I, I can't remember what it's called. Y'all remind me if y'all know what it's called. When, um... What is it called? When basically a victim of like sexual assault, rape, kidnapping, things like that, they grow fond of the person that took them or raped them or, you know, has been sexually assaulting them. I can't remember the name of the word. The, the, dang, I can't remember the name. I mean the word, but I'll figure it out. But yeah, so they expected her to be all happy and ready to go. And she was not. She was totally the opposite, total opposite. When they got back and they told her what happened and showed her the newspaper clippings and the articles about her kidnapping, she was pissed off. Like, what the, what you mean you press charges on him? You mean to tell me he has to go to jail? We were just on vacation. She trying to convince them everything that he told her. Tell them we was on vacation. She like, we was on vacation. You know, nothing happened. Oh, uh, it was a mistake. It was an accident. You know, please don't put him in jail because she's still under the impression that she has to complete this mission that the aliens had told her, which was get pregnant by the age of 16. And it had to be by Robert. He, he had her. She was gone. She was gone. They said when she got back, she was no longer their little girl, which is, you know, can be inspected. She was no longer like their little girl. She was still 12, but she did not have a 12-year-old mentality. She didn't have a 12-year-old mind. Um, the parents did, you know, uh, send the marriage certificate back to Mexico, you know, that he had a and to ask them to annul the marriage. So their marriage was annulled, you know, because they was about to let that stay. Nope. <laughs> nope. Not so you can probably take her again or whatever. You know, that's probably what they were thinking. You know, he could probably try to take her back. And it's this marriage certificate out there. Nope. So they made sure that was one thing that they did right. That was one thing that they did right. But, um... I think what kind of helped Robert's case as well was the fact that Jan, when she was doing her interview and everything, she would tell, was telling them that when he did, you know, try to sexually assault her, have sex, make love, whatever he wanted, whatever he called it to her, um, he didn't go all the way. 
So when she got back and the family had her um, examined and everything, you know, by a doctor, uh, they said, you know, her hymen was still intact. They didn't see any trauma. They didn't see any abuse. So they were pleased. They were pleased. And I think this is what probably helped motivate them to not press charges, along with the fact that he was going to tell that her husband was gay and that they were having sexual relationships. But, I mean, he didn't go all the way, so there was no proof that he had... And I don't know if maybe he used condoms or not, because... If they were having sex on a regular basis, I'm sure they would probably be able to find some semen. I don't know why they didn't find any semen or anything like that. But, you know, I guess if it ain't on her or in her, you know, they probably wouldn't have had a case anyway. If the, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's just all really shady to me. And that's why I don't, I believe the family is really leaving out some parts. I do believe that they are really leaving out some parts. Um, but basically when Jan came back, she was acting like everything was okie dokie. Yeah, he never did anything bad to me. We went parasailing. We went fishing. We did all these exciting things, you know, in Mexico. Um, when in fact he was actually sexually assaulting her for like three weeks but thanks to him brainwashing her and manipulating her <laughs> she she was like not about to tell anything and she was always defending him but anywho he he ended up getting off didn't didn't serve no no time the charges was dropped uh on his behind his name and it, it's not going to say pedophile and you know what got me during this documentary was the fbi agent pete welsh he said back then things like that were so uncommon to come to light like things of that nature i mean it's one thing for somebody to be kidnapped and raped because because back then in the 70s and 80s i mean from from john walsh story with his child i mean there's a lot of stories about back then with kids being kidnapped raped murdered all that but for what we call today as a pedophile or pedophilia they didn't use words like that back in the day he said the fbi agent was like i don't even know what pedophile was i can't even tell you if we used that word back then they didn't have a word for what was happening to a lot of children they didn't have a word for it a word for somebody who liked children they had rapists they had you know people who abused murdered and everything but as far as, like, I mean, they had child abuse. They had child abuse, too, for people who beat their kids half to death, burn their kids, tie their kids up, you know, all kind of stuff like that. Um, but they didn't have anything, they said back then, that dealt with pedophile. And I guess pedophiles, is it's a certain age group for them to call it pedophile. I was just like, the FBI was explaining all this, and, and some of it made sense, but some of it I was like, okay, what was you guys not taking that much notice, or like, like nowadays, when something happens with a child, and the law finds out, I mean, they getting the book thrown at them, they going to jail, they going to prison, then once they get in prison, if they ain't gay already, they might get turned out in prison or killed. Because of the crime they did. But back then, I think it was just so common, but not common, because it wasn't brought to the light. It wasn't brought to the light. A lot of people back in the 70s and early 80s were sexually assaulted or raped within their family or by a close family friend. And when they would speak up about it, it never came to light. It never came to light. And I think that has something to do about, I think that's why nowadays we have a lot stronger laws too. And how, and why the uh, time to like turn people in 
is a lot longer now. If something happened to you when you, like the statute of limitations for a little child is really, really a long time. Basically, you can, uh, if something happened to you when a little kid, you can go right now. I was raped. That Now, they might not have a whole lot of evidence when you're waiting all that time, but you can at least, you know, go to the courthouse, go to the police, to authorities, and let them know what happened. And you never know. A whole bunch of other people might come forward, and this is for people who might have went through something like this. A whole lot of other people might happen to come forward, which happened in this case, in this documentary. So sometimes it just takes one person. It just takes one person to expose somebody and it might work out for the best. But moving right along, moving right along. That was when he kidnapped her the first time. Now, mind you, I said from the beginning, he was able to kidnap this little girl twice and no charges were ever brought upon this man, ever. The first time, they didn't press charges because he threatened to expose them because he had a sexual encounter with the, with the dad. Now, as far as like, after this, I was just like, the mother... After you get your daughter back, you should have still seen the signs. Like the same signs that was there to begin with. You still have, like this guy has started making contact with her again. He was getting notes to her, getting letters to her. I mean, her whole behavior and everything had like totally, totally changed. She was no longer the little girl that they knew before the kidnapping. She was always angry. She was always talking, I want to go back to Robert. I love him. He's, you know, I want to marry him. I want to have his children. At that age, at that age, he was writing her all these love letters and she would write love letters back and it, it, it's, it's just so sad. I just can't believe, first of all, that the parents did There is nothing that you can do to me to make me let somebody walk free from raping my child, sexually assaulting my child, nothing like that. Nothing like that at all. Nothing. Nothing in my past. <laughs> nothing in my past, and I am far from a perfect person. Nothing in my past you could use to manipulate me to let you walk free. When she used to be, when you should be sitting on a cold, hard bed in prison for what you did to my child. No way. No way. But again, this was back, you know, in the early 70s. So, moving right along. Um, in 1975, he had basically started calling their house all the time harassing them, threatening threatening her parents because he wanted to be with their daughter. He wanted to be with their daughter. Uh, they was like, no, you're not going to be with my daughter. We are not. Because when he had got off that first time, he ended up moving away to Wyoming. He ended up buying a uh, kind of like a family fun center type of place with a lot of games, a lot of you know, a small water park, you know, things like that. He had ended up buying something like that. And for those of y'all who are on Instagram, if you want to continue this story with me, come to my uh, YouTube channel because I got 13 seconds left. Tanya Knows No Limit, my YouTube channel. So come on over there so you can hear the rest of this story. So anyway, sorry you guys, but I have to end my uh, Instagram. Um, but <clears throat> he was uh, calling and harassing the parents. 
and basically telling them if they didn't willingly agree to her joining him in Wyoming, coming to spend time with him or visit with him, that their daughter Jen, who was still a very young child at that time, would hitchhike her way all the way to see them. So, he's manipula manipulating the parents again. Manipulating the parents again. Um, She was like the mom, Marianne. He came down there, wanted to holler at the mom. I really need to talk to you. You know, there's some things I got to let you know. Some things I got to, you know, talk to you about. And I'm sure she was probably like, okay, this might have something to do with my daughter. You know, maybe if I go talk to him, maybe he'll leave us alone. She went to go talk with him and meet him in his little motor, motor home. And he started again manipulating her mind telling her and, and by the way this had to have been one of the weakest women you could probably ever cross you could probably ever cross he was manipulating her, her so well had him had her believing that he was in love with her confessing his love you know trying to get her to divorce her husband and i'm sure because he would have more access to jan the daughter but anywho, one thing led to another. From a kiss, they ended up having sex. Okay, so he didn't kidnap your daughter. He didn't had um a sexual encounter with your husband. He even had like a sexual encounter with you in the past but you claim it didn't go all the way through you guys didn't actually have sex it was just a lot of fondling kissing you know this time it actually led up to sex it actually led up to sex um the next thing you know they ended up having like an eighth month affair this is why I say this whole story does not add up. It just doesn't add up. It, it just doesn't add up. I really think that the whole reason why the mother didn't press charges was because, and mind you, the husband, the husband seemed to be weak as well. Even though he was, she was the housewife and he was the one out there, you know, bringing out, bringing home the bacon and eggs. Um, it seemed like the wife was able to manipulate her husband as well, many times. He knew that she was having an affair. He knew. He had sought out counseling. He had sought out help from their church. He had, you know, went to several people about the issue because he didn't know what to do with his wife because she slowly, she slowly became so intertwined with Robert. He didn't know what to do. Um... Eventually, somebody at his church told him, you have to put your foot down. You need to file for a divorce. So that's what he did. He filed for a divorce. Um, he took the girls and told them he was filing for a divorce. Um, of course, they weren't happy about it. You know, back then, people didn't get divorces. It was just you dealt, you dealt whatever hand you was played. Once you said, I do, you dealt with whatever hand you were played and you stayed in that marriage until you guys died or, you know, basically to you, to one of you died. But Robert, the man who was, you know, had kidnapped their daughter. Um, basically what had happened was like 20 months later, like a few years later, after the kidnapping, you know, the, the FBI and them said they still got to take this to court. They got to do something to this man. Even if y'all don't testify, you know, they still ended up, you know, trying to prosecute him. The most they could get was five years. But thanks to the parents not cooperating, it was reduced to 45 days. 45 days. He was supposed to be in jail for three months. It got reduced from five years to three months to 45 days. 
And that's when he had ended up moving to, you know, to Wyoming and everything. But Jan wanted to and kept begging to go be with Robert because she still was under impression. They had a mission to complete. She didn't want any harm to come to her family because of the uh, aliens that she was believing in. And so after Robert had threatened to have her hitchhike to Wyoming, Jan was finally like, okay, I can't have my daughter hitchhiking. Nope, you can't call the law and tell him that he's harassing you. You can't call the law and tell him that he's still trying to contact your daughter. You can't call. You didn't do any of that. Instead, okay, I don't want her to uh, hitchhike to Wyoming. So I'm going to just put her on a plane. <laughs> put her on a plane and deliver him literally like right in his lap. That's what she did. She put her on a plane. And the husband was like, yeah, I was pissed off. I was pissed off. And that's why I said I think the husband was even more weak than the wife was. Because <laughs> you just let your wife put your daughter on a plane. Now, at this time, um, I think she was I think she was uh, 15. Because they said like 20 months had passed. So, I think she was 15 around that time. And... They put him on a plane, and I can't. It's just some things in here that I just cannot believe. I, I just cannot believe. But anyway, she put on a plane, and she stayed there, you know, a couple of weeks. Um, After a few weeks, you know, then her mom, like, insisting, she needs to come back. She needs to come back home. You need to send my daughter back. You know, she don't need to be there with you. And finally, he sends her back. He sends her back, but he still, he still has some pull because once she got back, Jan, by then she's 15 years old. She's been with this man since basically the age of 12 off and on. He's done brainwashed her, uh, manipulated her and she's having tantrums and starting fights with her mom and dad or sisters and just acting, just acting a hot mess, a hot mess because she wants her mom to send her back. Um, they like, no, I'm sorry. Then he's calling, harassing them again. It's like starting all over again. He's calling, threatening, harassing them. Um, he even said at one point that he would take her and hide her in the jungles of Africa if they didn't send her back to him. The mom still was like, I'm not sending her back. That wasn't enough. That didn't stop him. Eventually, in October of 1976, on the night of October 10th, they went to bed. Her daughter, Jen, um, the mom was watching TV. The daughter, Jen, had came out into the living room and the mom was like, come here, let me talk to you, let me talk to you. She said no and stormed off back to her room like she was pissed because she was always angry and upset because she wanted to go back to the man. Um, the mom was like, I don't know, I guess she was like, oh, well, I'll deal with it in the morning, I don't know. The next morning they get up and she's gone. Jan was gone, there was a note. Um, basically saying she's going to be, you know, with Robert, they need to accept it. Uh, that's, that's what she left from a note saying they need to accept her and Robert's relationship. But when they had called, when the authorities, um, I mean, when they had called him, he's like, he don't know nothing about it. He don't know where she at. He don't know nothing. Maybe she ran away with some friends. Maybe she, he's playing it all off the whole time. Um, and even was calling them later, calling them talking about, I don't know. Have you heard from her? I haven't heard from her. I'm worried. I'm concerned, you know, stuff like that. Again, again. The man gets away with this again. The first time, they didn't want to press charges. They didn't want to call the police for like five days. This time, a few days went by. They ain't heard from their daughter. They lying, telling the community and everybody that she was with her grandparents. I mean, again, covering up a kidnapping again. 
they didn't they even said the father admitted that he didn't want to notify the authorities because they were embarrassed that the man was able to kidnap their daughter a second time so they didn't contact him right away um eventually eventually they contacted the fbi pete welsh who was working with them on the first kidnapping and he already knew that he probably had him robert probably had her even though he kept trying to convince them that he did not have their daughter and that you know she called him and told him that she was out you know making money working the streets that's what he was telling the parents yeah she called me she's out there you know making money and all this kind of stuff on the street <laughs> so i'm like like three months three months this is going on i mean they done staked out his place they done put surveillance on him they found out where he was they you know they staked out his uh mobile home um just like they did the first time when they kicked it down and you know brought her back from mexico but they didn't see anything no coming and going he was going back and forth to work to the grocery store i mean they didn't see one hair of this little girl um and then one day he had walked across the street or across the lot or something to use a payphone and so after he left they went and checked the payphone out and tried to see if they can recover uh information from who he called and a number happened to be circled in the phone book and the number was to a Catholic school in California, in California, IA. So they called the school and something just, you know, just instincts, the instincts the parents should have had that the FBI had, but you know, he's more trained, he's more skilled. So, you know, he should, but anywho, he, um, they called the Catholic school they there was nobody under the name of jan you know broberg um so basically they said well you know what this is what's going on they told him everything that's happened about the kidnapping you know everything and they ended up finding her listed under a different name instead of uh jan um broberg which is her real name um they had her under jan but her last name uh they changed they changed her last name so anywho um they were able to figure out where she was and she was in a catholic school and basically like he had no papers on this girl no nothing had enrolled her in a catholic school close enough close enough to him so that he could visit her on the weekends and had told the nuns at the catholic school that he was working with cia <laughs> <laughs> CIA and they had escaped from some Lebanon's um the Lebanon crisis or whatever over in Lebanon and her mom was dead and basically he told them you know I'm gonna enroll her in the school y'all keep her safe I'll visit on the weekends but if anybody come looking for her they could be the people who murder her mom so make sure nobody you know makes contact with her Lord have mercy this man he was able to manipulate the parents, the family, the community, his church, um, a Catholic school. He was able to manipulate uh, the police. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people. And I'm like, this is crazy. I just can't, I just can't believe it. this is, this is just crazy. So anywho, anywho. They ended up, you know, arresting him, um, brought him back to uh, Pocatello, Idaho, which is where Jan and her family stayed and where he met them. Um, Jan was forced to get back on a plane. Uh, she was so pissed. She was so pissed with her parents for making her come back again. Again, when she got home, her mom was there waiting on her, you know, of course, you know, mom's happy to see her and everything. She didn't say two words to her mom, just walked in the house, throwing in her room, slammed the door. Because she wanted to be with that man. It, it's so sad. It's so sad. I mean, this young child, after all this 
brainwashing and controlling her and molding her and grooming her and all this, she was so detached from her home life, from her family, her mom, her siblings, her sisters, um, her friends. She was she was basically like just an empty vessel. By then, she was just an empty vessel. She was absolutely no longer the little girl, the, the sister that they used to know. Um, of course, after that, uh, Robert, he kept threatening them again. He wanted their little girl back. He wanted to marry her. Um, she wanted to be back with him. He started to make threats. Ends up having a store set on fire. He didn't pay some fools in prison, I mean in jail, promised them a thousand dollars a month to burn down the little girl's parents' store. Um they ended up getting convicted for it. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't pin it on him for some reason. They didn't say, you know, but basically, basically, <laughs> this time around. After being, after being arrested and charged for first-degree kidnapping, he was acquitted. And it said because of mental defect, I'm thinking that's just like, you know, insanity, uh, being crazy, you know, something like that. They said mental defect. So he beat two kidnapping charges just because her parents wouldn't stand up for their daughter. He could have got 20 to life. He could have got 20 to life, but instead <laughs> they ordered him to a mental facility. He was released less than six months later, less than six months later. And then they come to find out, come to find out that Robert had actually tried to get help before for his fixation on, you know, Jan. He even went so far as to go out of town to see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist was some crazy wacko who wasn't even really a psychiatrist. He had had his uh, license taken. His It was revoked. Um, but basically, he was um, helping Robert manipulate this girl. He had the lady... He had told Robert... That he needed to spend as much time as possible with his neighbor's little girls. And Robert went and told them, the parents, what the psychiatrist said. Then he's like, I can give you his phone number and address and name if you want to holler at him. If you don't believe me. And then this is, oh my God. Again, the parents manipulated by him again. Maybe. Maybe not. Because, I, like I said several times already, I think there's some holes in this story. He was able to get them to allow him to sleep in their daughter's bed every single night. Well, not every night. I'm lying. Five days a week. It was five days a week. And this went on, you know, for quite some time. This went on for, like, I think six months or something like that um and then come to find out you know he was he claims he was sexually assaulted as a child um by an aunt and also by some other people um then he started assaulting his little sister uh so it was a lot of things that had went on early on in his life that kind of created this monster um you know that came to be that came to be but uh jan you know she's now a little older now hasn't been around robert for a long time and once she gets to like her 16th birthday now keep in mind the mission that she told she was supposed to do was to have a baby by the age of 16 by robert otherwise her one of her sisters would go blind the other sister would be murdered her mom would be murdered. And so, once 16 came, she was still kind of like believing that would happen because she didn't have Robert's baby. But, after the clock struck 12 and she realized, you know, she she's still alive. Her family's fine. Nobody's been murdered. Nobody's been hurt. That's when she kind of like 
okay, maybe that's not going to happen. And by that time, he also kind of lost interest with her. He wasn't communicating with her as much. He wasn't harassing her family as much. Um, she started questioning the existence of the aliens. And because nothing happened, she felt a little comfortable with, you know, going out of town, going to school, going to a university. Um, after everything that's been going on in her life for the last four years, her mom at first wasn't too, you know, she was kind of reluctant to let her go. But knew that she, you know, she she's 16 now. She, she wants to go to school. She wants to go to a drama camp, you know, with her friends and whatnot. So she let her go. She let her go out of town. And it was only for five weeks. It was a five-week camp. But she realized then, basically, after meeting some guy um, who really, really, really liked her, she realized then that maybe, maybe all this stuff that was inbred, ingrained into her head as far as the aliens and she and Robert and everything that he had, you know, told her about really wasn't true. Really wasn't true. Um, then one day, one day she just had, you know, to talk to somebody. Finally, she had to talk to somebody and say what really, really, really happened. And she told her best friend, Carolyn, and she told her sister, Karen, uh, about the manipulation, about the brainwashing, about everything. And they convinced her to tell her mom. She told her mom. Um, once they realized what had happened, they were like, oh my God, how did we know? How did we... And my thing is, even when she was when she was kidnapped the very first time, before she was kidnapped, when he was spending so much time with her and buying her gifts and taking her shopping and taking her out of town and on trips and all that, at 12 years old, a 40-year-old man, why weren't you probing more then? I mean, the parents, why weren't you probing more? And then once she came back, once they, you know, brought her back from Mexico after he had kidnapped her and took her there and married her and been having sex with her and everything. After she came back from Mexico, where was the counseling? Where was the therapy, the therapist? It was like they just went on with life like, oh, well, you know, our secrets are going to be kept. The fact that the mom slept with the... uh slept with the kidnapper after her daughter was kidnapped and continued to sleep with the kidnapper. The fact that the husband, the girl's dad, had sexual encounters with the kidnapper. They secrets were going to be kept secret. And no charges were going to be filed against the kidnapper, but there was still no counseling for the little girl. There was nothing. It was just like, I don't know. I don't know. Allowing that man to sleep in the child's bed. Then them having extramarital uh, affairs with the kidnapper. I can see why a lot of people do not believe this entire story. Like, I don't think it was as much manipulating as... The parents seem to say regarding them. Now, I do believe that for the child. I do believe the child. You know, she was manipulated. She was groomed. She was brainwashed. All that, I believe. But as far as the parents, like both of y'all having sexual relationships with him, and neither one of y'all knew the husband didn't find out about the wife until after she was returned home, the child. Um... I don't get it. The first time he took her to Mexico for weeks, um, he brainwashed her into believing she was half alien and she had to have a baby by 16, you know, in order to save planet Earth from some kind of apocalyptic, you know, catalysm. Uh, but I really think that the parents, not only were they trying to save face and keep they keep they uh sexual um activities with him 
secret. But I think the wife, when she said that she had really fallen for him, I think she was in love with him. I think the husband also was. And in order for them to keep on what they had going on, I think I think it was a lot, some blackmail possibly involved as well. Like he was able to extort the girl's parents into agreeing to sign papers <laughs> so that he wouldn't get, you know, so no charges would be filed. They refused to testify. They signed legal affidavits claiming they'd actually given him permission to leave the country with their daughter and have sexual relations with her and get married. And why? Because he was secretly sleeping with both of them? And didn't want him to reveal to each other, to each other. That That's why I say I think this was some kind of blackmail. Because at first, neither husband or wife knew the other person was having sexual um, encounters or relations with the kidnapper. So that's what I think. I think he used that between the two of them to continue his relationship with their daughter. That's what I think. That's what I think. He 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 talked he he talked his way. He manipulated him his way into their daughter's bed. And then claims that it was all because uh, he was infatuated with her, had a fixation on her because of what was done to him when he was younger, about the abuse and the trauma that he received as a child. Like, you allowed this man to sleep in your daughter's bed Monday through Friday for months. And because he told you his therapist said that would help him, and then the wife had an eight-month affair with the kidnapper who tried to get her to divorce her husband. Why? So he could have the wife and the daughters? He ended up only serving 45 days in jail. I mean, he ended up, end up sentenced to 45 days in jail and only served a few days. Now, because of a lot of communication the mother and daughter had years later after she was grown, the mother decided to put out a book um, and they put out a book and it was titled Stolen Innocence. She started writing it in the 90s and finished it around 2003. This man stalked them for a very, very long time stalked Jan for a very long time after that because he still wanted to be with Jan and he didn't when he found out the book was coming out he didn't want the book to come out so he was harassing and stalking them some more was showing up at all the events where they were speaking about the you know about the kidnapping and everything you know places they were invited to speak to people um, so they had to press a restraining order on him and got a restraining order on him. They filed a stalking order. Um, he contested it. He contested, contested it because he's crazy and they had to take him to court. Um, and then like, this is like 30 years later. This happened in 1974 and like 30 years later, he was still trying to manipulate them. But anyway, anyway, she received the order, you know, it was it was granted to her. And you know how normally it's for like, you know, a few years, a year, two or three years. She ended up getting a stalking injunction or a restraining order for basically the rest of his entire life. Entire life. But that never played out because the man committed suicide. 
Like he ended up in a situation where he assaulted someone with his car. Um, he was charged with three felonies and two misdemeanors. And just like before, when he kept telling people he would rather die than go to jail, than go to prison for any amount of time. He was serious. He took his own life. He took his own life. He he took a whole bunch of his heart heart medication. And I think his brother said he drunk like Kahlua and milk with the heart meds. You know, the milk and stuff helps keep it coated down and stuff. Anyway, he died. He died. And then after that, that was when um that was when they found out about the other women uh who he had sexually assaulted when they were little girls. One of them was actually a rape, which he was tried for and um convicted for, and he served a year. A year for rape. Keep in mind this is back in the seventies. This is back in the seventies. This is Idaho. Where they was, you know. It's just so sad. It's just so sad. This whole story is so sad. Mainly because of the little girls that were affected. You know, that were traumatized. That has to live with that for the rest of their life. Justice was served partially for one victim. But not for the others. And it was the same situation like with the um, Brobergs. He was able to manipulate his way with the other families. No charges were filed. And it's like, how can you do that to your child? I, I would I would never get over that. And people to this day do that with their children. They find out they've been sexually molested or raped by somebody they know. Now, when it's a stranger, now when it's a stranger, it, it seems a lot easier for people to press charges or want to go out and hunt them down. But when it's somebody in your very own household, your your neighbor, your pastor, your um your uh uncle, grandpa, brother, aunt, you know, your own parents, they they tend to sweep that under the door under the rug and then the child has to grow up holding all that inside of them. And the person who did it to them usually gets to still be around the family, still gets to be around, you know, in the circle. You seeing them on holidays, July 4th, Christmas, they buying presents for all the kids, you know. And that usually leads to the predator, the pedophile, to harm other children in the circle and outside of the circle. And that usually leads to the victim growing up feeling ashamed for the rest of their life like they did something wrong or not being able to cope, you know, with different things that go on in their life like they should or possibly harming other children along the way or um, not being able to hold or keep, keep themselves in relationships. Or being scared of men. Or men hating women. I mean, it's very sad. You know, it's, it's like a domino effect. When you don't handle that. And you don't do what you're supposed to do as a parent to protect your child. Which the, that family obviously didn't. I obviously didn't. But anywho, anywho. That's, that's my review of the story. That's my thoughts on the story. I had seen this story, heard about this story over the years, but it's actually on Netflix now and it gives you a lot more detailed information than what we might have heard throughout the years um, or in the books. And it was a very good documentary. It really was. Um, it's kind of... It kind of makes you want to cringe, though. It kind of makes you angry at the parents. Um, but, you know, I, I, would, I would recommend it. Although, you know, the, the parents got me feeling some type of way. Like, I just hate when parents do stuff like that. When they just allow somebody to get away with 
harming their child because they don't want the community or or family members or anything like that looking at them differently or they don't want to be blamed for what happened. So, anywho, y'all, if y'all watched the documentary, please let me know what y'all thought about um, the documentary or the story or anything about that pertains to um, secrets, family secrets pertaining to sexual assault and rape and things like that. Um, you can always put it in the comment section um, underneath uh, the video after I end the video. So, even after I end the video... Hit me up in the comments section if you got a comment about the uh, story. And I'll chop it up with you in the comments section. <laughs> but um, the, the, the review that I was supposed to come to you guys with today was going to be over uh, If Bill Street Could Talk with my uh, sister friend, Samantha, Sam. But as I had told you a few days back, if we got bad weather, Sam probably wouldn't be able to make it out to my home so we can do the review. And basically, it was like negative 40 degrees uh, with the wind chill here in Omaha today. So it, it like super, 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 super duper cold. I told her we'll do it another time. And I had seen reviews or seen people talking about this story on YouTube. And I figured, let me watch this movie so I can at least bring you guys some kind of review today. Not movie, but documentary. So I can bring you guys some kind of review today. Um, so that's why I decided upon this documentary because I had kept hearing about it. So anyway, you guys, again, thanks for tuning in. Please make sure you click the like button before you leave out the live. And also make sure you share. Please share this video. Um, it, it's, a, it's a serious video, but it's something that traditionally is not discussed in families. You know, during my days growing up, and a lot of my viewers, I know y'all around the same age as I am. So... I, that's why I, one of the reasons also why I chose this documentary to do a review on today, because people have to, we have to protect our children from these predators, from these pedophiles and keep our children safe. And why are we protecting them? Why? Makes no sense to me. Makes no sense to me. But anyway, in the meantime and in between time, prime time squad, y'all know how we do. Stay safe. Be blessed. And I'm out. Deuces.